Good morning. In his presence, church, Niagara Falls, New York. I see sunny, but it's not it's cloudy. Cloudy today. And uh, Facebook Live, YouTube later. I'm going to go right into the message because I got a lot to, to say today in God's word here. But God is always strategic. Part three. We're going to try to get through part three today. This has been interesting because just a little background on this. Part three. Um, the Lord had put on my heart with, you know, the eclipse, which, which was on April 8th. I didn't know that he was going to have me do a, a message that was going to go through April. But you know what? April 8th, even though that was a one-time event that day, the Lord is speaking through events. He's speaking through times and seasons. He's speaking to us. He wants us to know something a lot of things and and so he had impressed in my heart not to let go of that 4848 it just wouldn't leave me so I started going through all the scriptures and I thought whoa there is a lot here from Genesis through Revelation and um, and so I am gonna put my glasses on and we're gonna go through and so what I'm gonna do is finish up on the scriptures that I had left off on we're in the New Testament but then I'm going to kind of recap because the Father really wants me to go through and tell you what was it that he was trying to say to us. Because I really believe the Father is speaking to us. He's trying to get our attention. And I don't know about you, but um, I apologize that I have a tissue and I'm wiping my nose, possibly sneezing a little bit, but we're in full bloom here in western New York, and when we're in full bloom out there, I'm in full bloom in here, but um, the church has really gone astray. People have really gone astray. God's people have gone astray, and the church has too. And I think that's why the Father has this so heavy on my heart, because people are doing crazy things in the name of the Lord that aren't even really scriptural or accurate. And so, you know, one of the things, you know, Apostle Ryan popped on Ryan yesterday, and I didn't watch it until last night, and I was so grateful that he did it, because he, he was talking about how um, we... Not we, but like a lot of people are really touching other people and, and saying things. And um, the body of Christ has to really be careful. You know, I know there's a scripture that says, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. Mm -hmm. You know, the problem is when you don't, when you aren't under like solid leadership, you're not under, it was about coverings. And when you're not under a covering, you really could go all over the place. It's really important to be covered. And it's really important to know the word. Because if you don't know this, you could be led astray. You could be deceived. Amen. That's not what the Father wants for us. And so now you've had the church going all over the place, doing things that the Lord never really called them to do. And putting, like, demands and, and, and uh, restrictions. And, you know, the spirit of religion is a very deadly thing. The spirit of religion is a very destructive thing. And for people that are watching that, you might say, I don't understand. If you're a church, aren't you religious? But there's a spirit of religion. And the spirit of religion is different. It was the religious Pharisees and Sadducees that really were against Jesus and that freedom that he came to give his people. And I think sometimes the church, we put so many heavy demands on people that Jesus is easy. It's so easy to receive this love. And I feel like we've done something wrong. We've done something wrong if people don't know how easy it is to receive Jesus. So I'm going to start off in Ephesians 4, 8, 4, 8, because it was all 4, 8s. April 8th, and then we had a couple of earthquakes that were 4-8, and I thought, you know what, I'm not going to ignore 4-8. He's trying to speak to us through 4-8. So, um, and, and, you know, and I'm willing to say, you know, oh, if I made a mistake and I didn't hear right, but I know I heard my father. So I'm going to start on Ephesians 4-8. 
Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. He led captivity captive. And God and gave gifts to men. So God gave, he, he, he led captivity captive. He took it. And he gave us freedom. He gave us gifts. He gave us unique gifts. He gave us the fivefold ministry. He gave each one of us special gifts that we're going to use for him to lead people to him and to um, have them develop their walk with him. Okay, Philippians 4, 8. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody is called to the fivefold, but we are all called to preach the gospel, okay, and lead people to Christ. That's what we're called to do as the body of Christ. Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Wow. So this is our this is our character. This is how we conduct ourselves. This is how we think. Get this. Get a hold of this thing. Because you know, we are spirits, right? We have a soul and we live in a body. And so we're we're a three-part being. I'm going to tell you, the body is the flesh, right? It's hard. You gotta, you gotta slap that thing into, into subjection of the Lord. But, but our spirit is fine. The Holy Spirit. There's nothing wrong with the Holy Spirit in us. Nothing. Sometimes our spirit is a little though because we don't build it up. We don't build up ourselves in the Spirit and the Holy Spirit. But our soul. I've talked about this many, 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 many times. Our soul is the danger zone. It's very dangerous. I actually preached a message. The Lord had me preach a message on the dangerous soul. It's dangerous. And the soul is what causes us to think we're always right and we have to have an argument with somebody or we have to prove a point or we have to let someone know they're wrong and we're right. That's the soul. That's a wounded soul. You know, uh, the soul is the contentious little, well, spirit kind of, the contentiousness in us that we, we like to argue. The soul is the stubbornness in us. We want to have our way, when we want it, how we want it. The soul can do a lot of damage to other people. And the soul can do a lot of damage to you, to your own self. So we gotta, we're not going to go off on that, but because you know I can go on and on and on about the soul. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7 through 8. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. See, holiness is a good thing. It's a good thing. This is a call to the, to, to the commandments, really. They're not, you know, Jesus came to fulfill the law, but he never said, throw out the Ten Commandments. Just because Jesus fulfilled the law, we're not under the law anymore, right? But we're not still supposed to murder. We're still supposed to keep God first and love nothing else. We have no idols. Commandments are a good thing. Say the commandments are a good thing. We're not, I mean, we murder, I mean, you, you're not supposed to murder physically, but people murder with the mouth. I preached on that last week. We could cut someone hard with that tongue of ours. And, you know, we could, we could say things that are just not, not good. You know, I joke around with my husband a lot. My kids have been telling me, Mom, your jokes really aren't funny. And I don't know if people really know you're joking. They're not, they're not laughing. So I was like, oh, oh. So I want to, I want to apologize because Big Lou, I, I said, I threw you under the bus, I think, either last week or the week before. And I absolutely love you. You do well. You are, you're a rock in my life. He's, a, you know, I don't know. You, well, you guys all know me. I'm kind of like, do, 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 you know. Lou is stable. He's my stability. He keeps me grounded. If, he didn't, if I didn't have him, I'd be like, whew. Like, if someone would have to call me down to earth. So I repent. I repent before. I, say, I believe in that. You know, some people might be like, oh, when you're a leader, um, you shouldn't, no, no, I think when you're a leader, you should repent more. I think when you're a leader, you should repent more. And sometimes publicly. Because other
me tell you, I've preached this before, so I don't want to dishonor my husband because if I do that, then I'm dishonoring God. And that's number one. Number two, I've preached this many times before. I feel like I, I love when I see men built up. Because in this society, men are not built up. Men are cut down, they're ridiculed, they're demasculated, emasculated. That's a Jezebel spirit, right? Because she made them eunuchs. I'll just leave that there. So I don't want to ever open that door. So I am repenting because I don't want to ever open that door. So, so Lou, you are my stable force. He's like, yes, I know, Maria, I am. He's like, you don't have to tell me. But, um, you know, does he annoy me? Absolutely. Someone's like, okay, stop going your head. Don't, don't keep going. No, because, you know, we, as humans, we can get annoyed. We can disagree with people. We can disagree with a spouse, with, you know, siblings, with people in our lives, parents, whatever, children. We can disagree. But can we agree that we can disagree and still walk in love and not open the door to vanity? Amen? So there you go. There's a life lesson on humility and honoring. I want to honor. I want to honor my man. My man. Luigi. Luigi Pasquale Maravita. Okay, here we go. He's trying to like, please stop. Here we go. This is what I'm talking about. He's shaking his head. That means hone it in, Maria. Hone it in. But somewhere along the way, the church... This is one of the ways I believe the church has kind of went way off because we have allowed sin to creep into the church. Well, with dishonor, we've allowed sin to creep into the church with um, sexual immorality. We have. We've just been so accepting of everything because, well, we don't want to offend and I don't want to walk around offending people. But when we walk away from the standard, and this is the standard, this is the standard, when we walk away from this, we open the door to a lot of hoopla. And I don't want to even, I don't even want to go there. I'm not talking about the man of God. I'm not saying anything. But sometimes I think men and women of God are going to such extreme levels to try to reach their congregation or their flock. They're trying to really get their attention. And so they'll pull out all the stops and they'll do crazy stuff. And how many of you know I'm not here to entertain you? I want to come here, I want to give you the word, and I want you to be whole, made whole, and stay that way. I'm not going to bring in a bunch of gimmicks, and I'm not going to bring in a lot of, um, oh, I don't know. What am I trying to say? Entertainment. I'm not here to entertain you. I don't want, I mean, even our church, you know, someone, you know, some people have said to me, well, you're small because you really don't do anything for the community. Well, you know, well, we're little, and we're tired. We've been at this for years together, and it's the same crew. And it's like, I don't have the heart to be like, let's do a community outreach, because we're kind of like, I just got to get through this week, right? <clears throat> and so, I mean, we're growing older together. We have young ends. I mean, sure, we could put the young people on it. Hold on. Light bulb just went off. You could put the young people on it. Because the young people, they, they want young people. They don't want us old folk. They want the young people. But, you know, um, I do want to do community outreaches, and I want to do that, but we got to be creative with, with who we have and, and what we have and the, the strength we have left and the, I don't know, the energy level, I guess. Um, but I also don't like a lot of programs. Pastor Linda didn't want to put in a lot of programs. I don't like a lot of programs. They're, they're, they're not bad. They're not wrong. It's not that I don't like them. It's just I don't, I don't want everyone to come to the, the book of the month club. Okay? Because that would be great. We've talked about it. You know, I would love a women's group and a women's ministry and a men's group and a men's ministry. Like, ministries. I'd like the ministries to develop. But I don't want to have a lot of clubs and, and do you know what I'm saying? I don't want to have programs. I want Jesus and I want the Holy Spirit to move. So I'm not against them and I'm not against churches that have them. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying for me, for me, for us. <clears throat> now I'm going to go to, and then Monique came and she had, um, 
had preached about holiness. Holiness is still a good thing, right? Holiness is still right. So don't throw the Ten Commandments out the door. It's not a free will to just do whatever you want. Wouldn't you say in our society, children dishonor their parents? Wouldn't you say that? <clears throat> but parents dishonor their kids too. So, you know, sometimes when you're seeing dishonoring parents, um, the parents didn't instill a good relationship with their kids, right? And so that it all kind of plays together. But anyways, and you know, kids, if you honor your parents, you'll have a long life. So we want to honor our parents. So now we're going to go to 1 Timothy 4.8. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. I, God is not telling you not to exercise. God is not telling you that exercise is evil. But it, we have a, we're in a body here, right? And it's temporal. Like, you know, but we got to take care of our body. If we don't take care of our body, that's not what he's saying. We have to take care of our bodies with nutrition, with exercise. I'm, tr I'm trying to start exercising. I didn't exercise for a long time. Shame on me. But um, I wasn't taking care of myself, and the Lord is really having me do this a lot more, taking self-care and uh, taking care of my body. But, but if you are just focused on your body and exercise, but you never give anything to godliness and you never spend time with the Lord and work on your spirit and work on your soul, you're not going to gain, you know, you could have all the big muscles in the world, but if your soul isn't right and healed, right? And if you're mean inside, you're not walking by the Spirit, that's not going to profit you anything, okay? 2 Timothy 4, 8. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all, say all, all. who have loved his appearing. Yeah. See, we have literally been equitted from our sin. Do you know what it means to be acquitted? Forgiven. It's wiped clean. And praise God, right? So he has imparted in us righteousness. Jesus did that for us, to his believers. And so, you know, when you have people, if you've got someone in your life that's constantly trying to pick out your sin, that's not right, okay? Because our sin has been forgiven. And we have been made righteous through Jesus Christ. So Hebrews 4, 8 through 9. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. Now, this is, of course, the Sabbath day, too. Okay? So we're supposed to have a day of rest. We are not supposed to work seven days a week. There are seven days in a week. But we have to rest. We're supposed to work six days. I know people don't want to hear that. We like the five-day work week. A lot of places are like, I think we should go down to a four-day work week. We're actually supposed to work six days. Be busy six days and rest on the seventh. So you have people that are resting too many days, and then you have people that aren't resting enough. And, you know, God always sets the course for us. So it's the day of rest we're supposed to have. It's very critical. I had someone... Uh, speak into my life about the importance of my day of rest. But we also have rest in Jesus. Okay? We can rest in the Spirit. We can rest in His presence all the time. Do you know you can be very busy and be working and going here and going there and whatever, but still be in His rest? Do you guys have, do you know that? You could still be in His rest. You know, I had people that were praying for me for a while, and they were like, wow, we're trying to get you to slow down and pray. And I said, you know, actually, if you're, I have a lot to do because God has given me a lot of responsibility. So if you're praying that I would slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down, you're actually praying outside of the will of God for me, which is really witchcraft. Because really, and I said to, to very loving people, very godly people, I said, Pray that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, if you hear yourself saying, I can't, I just can't, I'm tired, I can't, I'm tired, I can't. No, you got to change the way you speak and say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
So pray for your pastor. Father, give her strength. Anoint her. That's all you have to pray. Anoint her to do all that she has to do in a day. Because I got lots to do in a day. Okay? I'm not saying that anyone's praying witchcraft prayers over me. I'm just saying we got to watch what comes out of our, our mouths. James 4, 8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Do you see how God is speaking to us? Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. <laughs> I love the word. So don't be double-minded. Do you know what it means to be double-minded? It means you're following God, but you're also following the ways of the world, too. Pastor John preached the hokey pokey. If you remember that, you know, we cannot be in the world and serving God. In the world, we're supposed to be living in the world, but we're not supposed to be like the world. We should look different. We should look like the light. Oh, there's my sheet. Okay. So now we have uh, 1 Peter 4 8. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. And that goes along with Proverbs 10, 12 in my notes. It said, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. God doesn't like hatred. If you have hatred in your heart, the Bible tells us the love of God is not in you. That's pretty strong and clear. 1 John 4, 8. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. How strong is that? Strong. Love truly is the life test. It's your life test. How much love are you walking in with people? Can you love people who annoy you? It's easy to love people who are just easy to love. But then there's people that are not easy to love. Do you guys know what I'm saying? Some people are not easy to love. Can you love them? Can we love people unconditionally? Jesus narrowed it down for us, didn't he? He took the Ten Commandments and he narrowed it down to this. Now, I'm not saying throw the commandments out the window, remember. But Jesus narrowed it down to love God first, above all else, and then love one another as we love ourselves. So then you got to love yourself too, not in a narcissistic way. Revelation 4, 8. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. How many of you know the church? Not, we've, always, we've always talked about the rapture. We've always talked about the second coming. We've always let you guys know Jesus is returning. Apparently, I've, I've scared children with that. I don't go that heavy on it. You guys all know there have been some preachers that go so heavy on it, it's scary. But I want this church to not be deceived. Jesus is coming back for a church without spot or blemish. If I don't tell you that, you're going to live life whatever way you want. Right? If I don't tell you, the church is going to get raptured. And someone might say, oh, the whole church? No. No, I don't believe the whole church will get raptured. The remnant will. Well, who are they? They're the ones that he's found faith with them. They have faith still. And they love God. And they love people. See what I'm saying? Do you not see how God has talked to us? through this whole thing. This is why I didn't want to blow it off. Because I was like, no, you know what, Father? I, when I opened up to Genesis 4, 8, and I was like, who? Oh. And then I went to Exodus 4, 8, and I went, who? Oh. And then I kept going, and I was like, oh, oh, well, oh. The Father is speaking to us. He's talking to us. He wants, are we hearing? Are we listening? Are we hearing? Are we hearing what the Father is saying? How many of you want to hear what the Father is saying? I'm making such phenomenal time. I think I'm going to go through this. I have been anointed today. Woo! -hoo -hoo. I slept last night. I'm anointed. Okay. So, in this whole thing, God had me start with Genesis 4-8, right? 
So what do we think God is trying to speak to his people about? Let's, let's find out. So right at the beginning, right to the end, we're going to summarize. Number one, the Lord is telling us to watch what is in our heart. Watch what's in your heart. He is warning us to not have a murdering mindset physically or verbally with people. With people, with groups of people, okay? They may not be your group of people, but we are not to hate them and murder them with our mouths. God is the, number two, God is the God of restoration. He patiently works with us to see his power and great love for us, even if our heart is hardened like Pharaoh's was, right? He's patient with us. We're the ones that are impatient with people. Well, why aren't they changing? Right? What if a pastor gets up here and says, I've been faithful, God. I've been preaching week after week after week after week, and people aren't changing. And he's like, I'm patient with people. Aren't I glad that he was patient with me? I am. I'm very glad that my God was patient with me. So maybe we can be patient with others. Do you think? I'm trying to hold the sneeze back in. I don't want it to be one of those loud, obnoxious ones. If I do sneeze loudly, I apologize. I'm not trying to scare anybody. Some are deep. Number three. Jesus took away our sins. Now, this is even Old Testament. Jesus took away our sins before we even knew about Jesus. People can't do it for us. Okay? He did it all for us. We just have to receive it. God took our sins away from us through his son. And in Old Testament, you know, the Old Testament, I, 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 I don't know. There's so many Christians that don't really like to read the Old Testament. I like to read both. Because the Old Testament is packed with the foreshadowing of Jesus Christ, number one. Number two, also, like, what's to come. And number three, it's the Old Testament is packed with things of, okay, don't do what they did. Learn from people's mistakes. Then you got the, books, uh, the book of Proverbs. Woo! That is the book of wisdom. The church is lacking wisdom. I'm going to get there in a, a minute. I know if we're lacking wisdom, we should just ask for it, right? But Jesus made a way for all of us. All we have to do is receive it. Number four, God cares and covers his people with his blood. His blood covers you. We can enter into his presence at any time, just like the table of the showbread and the scarlet cloth. See, now I'm going back to what we were talking about with the Old Testament. There is, you mean to tell me that the scarlet cloth was a coincidence? No, it was not. The, the table of the showbread, that is, man, that's his presence. See, all these things in the Old Testament were Jesus. I don't know. Guys, I'm giving you a lot more better information than you're letting on right now. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Coley, behind the camera. Thank you. So, by the way, did anyone even listen to last week at all? Could you hear sounds in the background, or was it better? Was it better? Yes. You did it, Coley. Cool, I love you. You Let's rock, go. man. You rock. All right, so. I'm sorry that I'm wiping my nose. I know I keep apologizing, but it's embarrassing. Number, oh, I did number four. Okay. And the, oh, by the way, number four, that's why we plead the blood of Jesus. Okay. It, the blood covers us. Number five, we are to keep God's word for ourselves, to not forget any of his promises. And we are to teach his word to our children and our grandchildren. We're supposed to keep his word. We're not supposed to throw his word out. We're not supposed to read it one time and then be like, oh yeah, we don't need that anymore. No, 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 no. We're supposed to read his word, meditate on it, keep his word, and then teach our children and our grandchildren. I can't wait till one day I'm blessed with grandchildren if the Lord shall tarry. Anywho. Number six, 
we have 10 commandments to follow, which is our really our moral set code. It's our moral law. The 10 commandments are great. You want to know how to live morally as a society? Just follow the commandments. It's a moral code. And Jesus came to fulfill the law, not to erase it. I already talked about that. Number seven, the Lord wants us to know we need to watch our attitudes and be obedient to God. He still speaks through his prophets, everybody. So stay in his presence. And he wants us to stay in his presence. He doesn't want us to just do our own thing. There's a lot of churches out there that say that prophecy is not for today. It is. He still speaks through his prophets, okay? There's some fruits, nuts, and flakes out there, but you just got to hone in. Number eight, God wants us to know that the Bible is his word, and it's where God dwells. He dwells in his word, and he provides for his people. He sets a table for us, and he joins us around it. Isn't that wonderful? That was all Old Testament, and now um, we can see the New Testament correlation with that. From Nehemiah, we learned that we need to be praying to our God and keep watch day and night. We must be alert and vigilant in prayer for Jerusalem, the peace of Jerusalem, and also for our country. We have to be vigilant in prayer. We learned that from Nehemiah. And Esther, we learned that just like Esther had to pray for her people of Israel, we must also fight and pray for God's people, Israel. And we must also fight for our own country, our own country's Christian values. If we don't fight for our values, we're going to lose our country. And we have a great country. The way of the Lord is right. This is what we learned from Esther. The way of the Lord is right. And we must follow his ways, his word, and his precepts, not the world's ways and values. If at any point the church stops following the word of God and his precepts, and we start following the world's values, which I'm going to tell you, much of the church did. It caused, look at what we're dealing with. It's chaos in society. It's chaos. And it's not God's intention for us. He doesn't want us to live in confusion and chaos. The Bible tells us that God is not the author of confusion. So that's how we know we have to stay true to his word, okay? We learn in, um, let's see, in Job, we learned that we have to follow his ways and his word and his precepts. Okay, sorry, that was Job. Okay, so now Psalms, we learned that don't sow trouble. If you sow trouble, you're going to reap the same. It's the whole sowing and reaping um, principle. That makes sense, doesn't it? So God is trying to tell us, don't sow trouble for other people. If you're sowing trouble for other people, did you ever see somebody who wants to get someone in trouble? They want to get someone in trouble. So they, they work a little plan, and the things that come out of their mouth, it's so that that person will get in trouble. I'm dealing with this right now. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be alerted to things that are wrong in leadership. But if someone is intentionally trying to get someone in trouble, why? And, and, the, and the reason why might be very valid and might be good. In this case, it is valid and good. But in, in another situation, I've seen people tell me stuff that I'm like, you're just telling me because you want me, you are trying to get so-and-so in trouble. That's a troublemaker. And so God doesn't want us to do that. He's telling us in his word. He wants his people to know. In 2024, on April 8th, he wanted you to know and to carry on, not just throughout April. Keep carrying on, everybody. 2024, he's telling us, don't sow trouble for people. You make trouble, you get trouble. Capiche? Capiche, Luke? Capiche. Capiche. Thank you. <laughs> Christ the King prep kids know to say capiche. Okay, I don't know why. Twelve, know that God makes us dwell in safety and to lie down in peace. God lets us be safe. 
He hides us under the shadow of his wing. He wants us to lie down in peace. He doesn't want us carrying all of this strife and, and whatever, right? Also, the Lord wants us to know that we are to exalt wisdom and embrace it. That's 13, point 13. He wants us to seek wisdom. And if we don't have wisdom in the matter, ask for it. Ask for it. Father, I don't, and it's okay to say, you know what? I don't have wisdom in this area. I need this. I need wisdom in this area. And I'm going to tell you something. That is why I have planted myself um, under the apostle that I have because he pours into his people so richly and strongly that I've seen growth just in my own self. I hope you guys have too, but since I have been under his leadership and, you know, I mean, I, you know, my family was joking around with me yesterday because they're like, you don't have to buy every book he has. I'm like, yes, I do. And, you know, I'm like, you know, you don't have to go to every single, yes, I do. You don't have to, and I, I'm doing the mentorship with him. It's called Access now, I believe. And, um, it, it's, you know, do, am I paying for it? Yeah, but I'm paying for richness. So I, I see these things as almost like college courses. And I see these things almost as, listen, it's worth it for me to pay to get wisdom and training to be a better leader for you guys. If I'm being trained up and made whole and made well, and being taught to go, don't go this way, don't go that way, go, do you know what I mean? Then I am, I think that I'm a better leader for you. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So it's worth it for me to pour into my growth. And I believe, even if you're a leader, even if you're an apostle, I think apostles need to be poured into. And so um, our apostle pours in, into your leader and, and you. I know many of you are following him as well. So number 14 in Ecclesiastes, we see that vanity is not good. God doesn't want us to be vain. Vanity is not good. It is okay, women, to wear makeup. That's not what I'm saying. It's okay. But when we are so concerned about our physical appearance and how we look to other people, it's not healthy for us, Okay. Number 15, we have to pray and repent. God wants us to pray and repent. Number 16, God continues to give his people dreams and visions today. The Holy Spirit gives us the ability to interpret the dreams and the visions. It never stopped in the Old Testament. We can have dreams and visions today. Do you see how much stuff is power packed that Lord, the Lord wanted us to have? I mean, he is talking to his people today. Are we listening and receiving? I hope so. I hope so. Number 17 in Hosea, we learned that we must never stop obeying God. We must always heed his warnings. We must always follow him and stay in his presence. Stay in his word daily. Staying in prayer and fellowship with others. That's what he wants for us. And number, and number 18, always the message is to repent and turn back to the Lord. He brings up repentance a lot throughout these topics and these chapters. And it's like, oh, he really wants his people to repent. Return to him. That's the key. If you stray, don't stray. But if you do, go back to him. Repent and go back. It's always okay to go back. God gives us all the answers that we need. Amen? Always. All right. Go back to him if you've repented. Don't be afraid. Uh, God, and also, God doesn't change. He remains the same. He wants his people to know that. He's not changing. He is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. Jonah, we learned in number 19. In Jonah, we learned that we follow God right away when he gives us a direction or an, or an order. So, you know, Jonah did not. And what does that teach us? That disobedience causes delays. Do you notice how when Jonah disobeyed God, he didn't do what God asked him to do right away. God didn't say, I'm done with you, Jonah. Do you notice that? So even if you disobeyed God and you didn't do what you were supposed to do right away, God will still use you. You just cause a delay for yourself. That's all. You just cause a delay. Okay, now, 
as a little side note. Number 20, in Micah, we learn that the Messiah reigns in Jerusalem, and we have all been grafted in and are fulfilled. Number 21, God still sends his messengers in Zechariah. And then we write on to the New Testament. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we learn, in number 22, we learn that the New Testament is God's love letter to us. And he's letting us know that when the devil tempts you, and he will, he will tempt you, Jesus, what did we learn from our master? What did Jesus do? He rebuked him, and he used the word. He spoke the word. What is God trying to tell his people today? Speak the word over your life. Speak the word over your life. If you're having a relationship problem, speak the word over it. I thank you, Father, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I thank you, Father, that I am the head and not the tail. I thank you, Father, that you want me to prosper in all things, even as my soul prospers. I thank you, Father, that you have good gifts for your children, and I am your child. And you have good gifts for me. I thank you, Father, that nothing is impossible with God. Mm -hmm. See, these are the words we're supposed to be speaking. So then if a doctor gives you a report, you can say, mm -hmm. <laughs> my sister and I, when we were sitting in the uh, in an office, and she was given a diagnosis, the, the final diagnosis, and we just sat there. And the nurse got mad at us. And she was frustrated. She was a lovely person. I'm not mad at her. <coughs> and she said, it's okay to cry. You just heard terrible news. It's okay to cry. Now, the doctor was a born-again Christian. He knew exactly what we were doing. And my sister said, I hear this report. And she looked at me. I said, I hear it also. We heard it but we weren't receiving it in our spirit. And so we were standing on the word of God. It didn't come out the way we wanted it to, but we did what we were supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Amen? I remember having lunch with Pastor George before he went home to be with the Lord, and he was like a spiritual father to me, really. I just absolutely trusted him and adored that man of God, and I remember saying, I just, I don't understand. I mean, we, we stood and we stood and we prayed. And I mean, Pastor George, we thought she was going to resurrect and come upstairs at the funeral home. And, and I, I thought she was going to, we all thought she was going to walk through the doors. And he was, that's what you were supposed to be believing for. You didn't do anything wrong. We, we were standing in faith. That's how strong our faith was. Yeah. However, we all knew if he, she saw Jesus, her husband, Adios, amigos. I love you all. I'll see you on the other side. She was not returning. But God wants us to know. Jesus taught us that his word, his word, his word has power. Power, power, wonder-working power. Amen? His blood still works, and it has power as well. In Acts, we saw uh, point 23 that Peter is moving by the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to move by the Holy Spirit, too, to heal uh, based on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And he heals today, too. Jesus never stopped healing. Okay? We can still pray for healing for people. In Romans, in point 24, we learned that we are blessed because Jesus does not impute sin on us. Once we have been, we have repented and we receive him as Lord and Savior, our sin has been forgiven. It's done and it is gone. And then in 1 Corinthians from last week, 25, you are already full. You are already rich in Christ Jesus. Jesus reigns with you and you reign with him. You reign with him. We're seated in heavenly places. In 2 Corinthians point 26, even though we are hard pressed on every side, my friends, we are not crushed. 
We are never forsaken and we are never destroyed. You know, I don't know, I don't know who taught Christians that once you become a Christian, we're running through fields of daisies and tulips and singing kumbaya and everything is glorious. It's not. The Bible says, even though you're crushed or you're, you're pressed, you're pressed on every side, you're not crushed. You might be facing issue after issue, problem after problem. You're not destroyed. You are not destroyed. Amen? Okay. And you're already full. You're already full. Just keep getting filled up with the Holy Spirit, but you're already, everything has been done. You see, Jesus is just trying to tell you. God is trying to speak to his kids. In all these four eights, he's giving us basically a checklist of everything that's been done for us. Do this, don't do that. Do this, don't do that. Do this, don't do that. Didn't he do that in Deuteronomy? Do this. It'll be good. Don't do that. Do this. Don't do that. I feel like this is a matter, maybe this is a matter of day in Deuteronomy. Don't forget his word. Don't forget who he is. Don't forget his power. We don't serve a wimpy, a wimpy God. In Galatians, we learned, and this is point 27, once you know God, once you know him, how can you go back to the ways of the world? Mm -hmm. How can you? Your heavenly father does not want you to go back to the ways of the world. It's bondage for you. Jesus set you free. And when Jesus sets us free, we are free indeed. And then we learned our final points today with what, what I started with. I feel like God is trying to tell his people something. He's trying to say to us, these are the things I want you to do. I want you to know who I am. I keep going back to this, don't I? I want you to know who I am. That's what he's saying to his children. Daughters, sons, I want you to know who I am. I want you to know who you are in me. I want you to walk in your authority. I want you to carry your authority. I don't want you to believe the lies of the world. I don't want you to do the things of the world. I want you to do the word. He wants us to know it. He wants us to receive it. He wants us to do it. He wants us to be doers of the word not just hearers of the word only. He doesn't want us to look like the world. He doesn't want us to look like them. He wants us to stand out. We're peculiar people. We are unique. We are to stand out. We are not to look like everybody else. We're not supposed to do what the world is doing. What happens, guys, you know this, right? We've all raised kids. He's young yet still. Praise the Lord. Enjoy this time. I know for young parents, they have little ones, and they're so exhausted because that's the season they're in. So they're, they're not sleeping. There's all these issues. They're always sick. There's always this. But treasure that time because then when they get older, the world starts pulling on them. Although I want to say I'm hearing a lot of things, and the world is pulling on tinies. I, I heard some devastating stuff last week. It's just a lot. Our kid, the enemy, how many of you know the enemy is after our children? Yeah. Okay? I praise God that he had us start this little tiny school <laughs> with six students. I was faithful. We were faithful and we were obedient. We knew we looked crazy, but we started with six students. And, and you know, granted, we've been running for quite a few years and we're up to 32 this year. But you know what? People might say, well, that's still so tiny. Well, listen, for us, that's big, you know, and we're growing next year, too. And I'm just sitting here, like, after this week, we had some issues. And, and I sat there and I thought, and we were talking to a counselor. We had a counselor come in, and he was saying, thank God you guys have this for kids. That Christian families, and even non-Christian families, because this school, we take kids that don't believe in Jesus and their families as well. I mean, they, they learn about Jesus here and some of their families, of course, but um, we just want to take in kids because we want this to be a safe haven. And when we started it way back when, I remember my sister saying, Maria, we don't know why God is doing this now, but he knows what's coming down the pike. We don't. He does. 
And lo and behold, here we are in 2024. Amen. Woo! Amen. Jesus was right. Amen. The Holy Spirit was right to impress on us to start a school way back. And to, you know, and it has not been easy. There have been many, many, probably every year where I've been like, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this to myself? It's crazy. And then a child will pray for another child. Or I'll have a headache and one of my students who was not a Christian is like, Miss Maria, can I pray for you? And lays hands on me and gets on their knees. And I'm like, oh, okay, Father. I have been rebuked and corrected. And then I'm like, that's why I'm doing this. And you know, when Ann and I will look at each other, and I'm like, you don't need to say it, Ann. I understand the correction. Why am I doing this? Lord, throw me a bone. And someone will come to the door. <laughs> right, Ann? We, we, one of the books we read in our curriculum is George Mueller. And we, Ann and I, the first year we read George Mueller, we were, we were crying because we're like, <laughs> we're George Mueller. Like, this is us, you know, because George Mueller had, uh, he was a missionary and he started an orphanage. Okay? He didn't have anything. Like, I started this school. We didn't have covering. We didn't have a big ministry. Here's 25,000. Get started, sweetheart. Nope. We started with nothing. And, um, you know, <laughs> it's been hard. And there were times where George Mueller would, they didn't have milk for the kids. And they would sit down and they would thank God for the milk. And, and then all of a sudden, the doorbell would ring, or not the doorbell, someone would knock on the door back then. And a milk truck broke down. And he had to help somebody with like a flat tire or something. And to thank him, he gave them milk. The true stories. These are true stories. If you ever want to get your faith stirred, start reading about missionaries. Because these people have nothing often, and they live by faith. And then the same thing with bread. He didn't have anything for them to eat, and then something happened with the bread, and bread got delivered to them. I mean, come on. God, do you think, and then April, you sent me that video, the girl with the car, she needed a car, and she just asked for it. And, you know, and, and she was adorable. Oh, my gosh, what a doll she, she was. She just stirred my heart yesterday and blessed my heart. And I'm sitting there going, you know, why? Why do we think our father is not capable? Our father is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is the creator of the universe. Why would we think anything is too hard for our God? Why? Why in this day and age do we still think that we can't ask our dad for food if we need food? Or new shoes. Father, I need new shoes. I need you to open the door. Father, I need a new pair of pants. I, Father, I need... $50,000. I need it, Father. I really need it. Why, why would I not ask my dad for it? Why would I not say, you know what, Lord? You know what I really need? I need $125,000 and I need it now. I need it today. Why would I not have faith that my dad can get it to me somehow? And then, you know, people, oh, money doesn't grow on trees. And, oh, okay, okay, here are the Christians. Pennies are falling down from heaven. You got to, I am one of those people. I believe the word. You don't work, you don't eat. I believe in being a hard worker. I was raised in a family. We worked hard. Amen. We are not afraid to work. Amen. We will work long hours. We will sacrifice. We will sweat. I believe in sweat equity. I believe in putting the time in. Most millionaires are not just millionaires sitting in their living room eating Cheetos with their feet up watching TV. And how many people want a million? And then the people get snotty about millionaires. Mm, must be nice. Yeah, it is nice. Do you know how hard they work to get there? I hope they're, they are sitting there with Cheetos. They're probably not eating Cheetos. They're not healthy for you. But anyways, 
But what I'm saying is why, but, but there are times in life where someone can't pay a bill or they don't have it to do this or they don't have it to do that. Why do we think our God cannot provide? What does the word say? The word says, my God shall supply all my need, all my needs, according to his riches and glory. Who's God? My God. I don't know what your God is doing, but my God is supplying all my need. And, and how faithful, I'm like, Lord, I love it if you could just give it to me now, one lump sum, you know, at one time. But how, how could we say, honestly, every single year he has met us. He's been faithful. Amen. See, that's why I get emotional when I start talking about my Heavenly Father, because he's so real to me. He's so real, and he's so God, he's so true, because sometimes life just isn't going the way that you intended for it to go. And, and things aren't lining up the way you want them to line up, but, but if you stay faithful, if you stay in faith, you can say, you can say this, my God, my God is faithful. My God will supply all the things that I need according to his riches and glory. God knows if you need a car. God knows if you need a heal. It might not be materialistic. It might be, you might need a healing. You might, you might need restoration in your marriage. I have seen marriages crumbling and burning to the ground. And I've seen those same marriages whoosh, whoosh, turn around. I've seen people heal. I've seen miracles. I have. My God is faithful. Your God, our God is faithful. He's faithful. He loves you. Look at the songs that he had for us this morning. He wants you to know who he is. How faithful he is to you. How much he loves you. You have a place with him. He's never going to turn his back on you. He'll never forsake you. He'll never leave you. Please get it. I pray we all get this. Even me. I pray that I really get who my father is. And you know what? I know for a fact. You know, some people will say, well, you know, because you've done the school now you're doing the church and now you're doing and you really don't have a lot of time to do anything and I'm like you know what I don't know if you've met me or not but as soon as someone tells me you can't you know there's that mm -hmm. I got that oh no I can I can I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me amen, amen. and my dad will open a door for me and I can ask him, I can say, Father, give me the thing that I can do easily, that I can make money and like support, help support my family with, with the hours I have left, Lord, with the strength I have left at my age. And when I'm not that old, but, you know, I definitely can feel a difference. And, you know, it, you know, it's just my God will provide. I trust him. And then when doors aren't opening yet, I'm like, oh, I'm getting a little nervous, Lord, I'm getting a little nervous. Maria, you know, my father will be like, calm down. Because maybe that door hasn't opened yet. Maybe if I get distracted with this door, I'm not going to walk through this door that I need to walk through. And that door might be like, bada bing, bada boom, and there we go. Do you see what I'm saying? So you got to ask God for wisdom. How many of you feel blessed by this message? That the Father gave us wisdom with this. Now, Rose, I don't know if you want to come up and give your thing. I could do hand sanitizer on the mic. Yeah, there's time. Come on. Someone get me a hand sanitizer bottle so I can wipe down my mic. It's out in the hall. And I didn't mean you. Does anyone have hand sanitizer in their purse? Okay. Let's, let's squirt our mic down. Just because I'm calling it an allergy, but who knows? We don't want to call it an allergy and it's a cold. It is springtime. It is springtime, but it could.
could be the rhinovirus. You got it? Squirt this. I'm not trying to be bossy. Squirt this, Rose. Oh, there you go. Okay, watch this. Put my hands here. Sorry. There you go, my friend. Okay. Thank you. That was awesome, Pastor. And it's always a great reminder of the things that God wants us to know about Him and what we can just soak into our spirit with it. Um, I wanted to just kind of, and, and Pastor was kind enough to give some time to this because it is still recent, and even though the eclipse has already happened, um, the Lord is still speaking to us through signs and wonders. Yeah. And when we last spoke about this, you know, I was talking about Troy Brewer, who's a mighty man of God. And Troy has a huge church, and he helps actually people that are in sex, sex trafficking. Um, he's rescued many people that uh, throughout the world that have been trafficked. And he's very prophetic as well. And one of the things that we had talked about is that radical seekers become radical finders. Mm -hmm. And it's the passionate love of Jesus is revelation in itself. Like Pastor was saying, if we get it in here, how much God loves us, it's like this overflowing love, yeah. we're going to start pouring it out. We're going to, like, just be very welcoming. And, um, you know, I had an, uh, a very serious incident happen this week with my family. I have a special needs sister who is, cannot speak for herself. She's very defenseless. She was born developmental, developmentally disabled, so she cannot communicate at all. And she was basically physically, not physically, but verbally attacked by a higher functioning resident. It took everything I had not to want to lash out at this other resident. And I, obviously this, this person has things going on with her, so <laughs> that's, that's another reason not to lash out. But I've learned through this church, through the word that's been spoken to me, that it's not the, the, it's not the physical person that's causing this. It's the demons within this person that is causing uh, them to want to physically attack staff and to also uh, verbally attack people that are defenseless. And then right back to the word. Uh, Troy was mentioning that, you know, there are signs and wonders all throughout the Bible. Uh, one of them being Luke 21, 25 through 28. He says there'll be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. He talks about in Luke, the earth being in distress. So when we have earthquakes, like Pastor was saying, just right around the eclipse and a 4-8 uh, on the Richter scale, there will be troubles in the nations, bewilderment and perplexity. So nations without resources, nations not knowing which way to turn. Um, and we learned that Jonah actually had a solar eclipse in Nineveh, and within three days the people repented. Um, Jonah said, it, you know, he goes, he goes, to Nineveh, and he says, you know, you're gonna burn if you don't turn. You're gonna burn if you don't turn. And he gave them basically 40 days. That's what the Lord had spoken to him. So read Jonah, it's a very short chapter, but it's a great chapter yeah. about God's heart and that he only puts up with so much. And then something happens. Um, we also, in NASA actually, um, reports that the Assyrian eclipse, which is in Nineveh, occurred June 15th, 763 BC. Jesus talks about the sign of Jonah. And he says that, and this is in Matthew 16, one through four, and it's very short, so I'm gonna just read it real quick, because if Jesus is talking about it, we need to pay attention for sure. Matthew 16, then the Pharisees and the Sadducees came and testing him, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today 
for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. What is the sign of the prophet Jonah? It's the eclipse. Mm. It's the solar eclipse that has happened throughout time, from before Christ came through today. And there's more coming. Seven years ago in 2017, on August 4th, the Great American Eclipse, it was called. Why? Because it was the first time since 1776 that the solar eclipse only touched America. That was the birth of our nation. It was a miracle because God made it such that the sun is 400, the sun is 400 times bigger than the moon. The moon and is 400 times further than the moon from our perspective, which means that they both look like they're about the same size when the solar eclipse happens about the size of a quarter. This 2017 solar eclipse was one hour and 33 minutes from the time it began to the end of it. It was in 2017. Psalm 133, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's a call of unity for the body of Christ. Pastor was talking about what's the Lord trying to tell us? Get together. I don't care if you're Protestant, Episcopalian, or you know whatever. Get together as a body in unity and work for his kingdom. Amen. 2017, the eclipse was 130 miles wide and passed over seven cities called Salem. Salem is a word for peace. We know Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And it's the place that's found in us after total reconciliation with God himself. What's interesting about the 2017 and the 2024 eclipse is the span of time it took. It was seven years. We know the Bible speaks of seven-year cycles. In Ecclesiastes, a time, to, a time to give, a time to mourn, a time to die. Seven-year cycles. So this is also the word of the Lord. Bless you. Bless you. That the word of the Lord was in Joseph about seven year cycles. The last place the shadow of the 2017 eclipse touched was Fort Sumter, South Carolina, where the Civil War began. Six years, six months, and six days later, we have another eclipse in the U.S. The path forms an X. 2017 and 24, the 2017 eclipse went this way. The 2020, pardon me, the 2017 eclipse went yeah, this way, and the 2024 eclipse went this way, forming an X. Where does that X land in the United States? It lands in a place called Little Egypt, Illinois, formerly called or formerly called Little Egypt. It's now called Carbondale, <coughs> Illinois. Bless you, Pastor. That's <laughs> okay. Okay. Little, it was called Little Egypt because there were little mounds of dirt in this area way back in history, and people called it Little Egypt. This eclipse in 2024 went through at least seven cities in the U.S. called Nineveh. Nineveh, Texas. Nineveh, Ohio. Nineveh, New York. And then it passed over Nineveh, Nova Scotia, as it exited. It's a word from the Lord, and this is it. And it's not particularly for this church. I'm, I'm talking as a, as a body of Christ, turn or burn. God is not playing. He's making it very clear. He's making an offer to get into covenant with Jesus, the Prince of Peace, our Redeemer. The 2024 eclipse on 4-8, Exodus 4-8, God tells Moses, if they will not hear you for the first sign, then maybe the second they will hear you. Then God said, if they, Israel, who is enslaved by Egypt, will not believe you or heed the voice or the testimony of the first sign, they may believe the voice or the witness of the second sign. The first sign was the Lord telling Moses to cast his rod, which is authority, onto the ground and it became a serpent. 
The symbol of divine power and royalty was worn on the crown of the pharaohs. What was it? A serpent. Yeah. The Lord tells Moses to put forth his hand and take the serpent by the tail, and it became a rod in his hand. So he's saying, take our authority. Take the authority that you have through Christ Jesus, Amen. and don't be passive when the enemy is trying to attack you. It took everything I had yeah. not to want to lash out against this person who was trying to get against my defenseless sister. The 2024 eclipse entered the U.S. at Eagle Pass, Texas. And remember, the 2017 eclipse exited where the Civil War began in Fort Sumter. This 2024 eclipse entered at Eagle Pass, Texas. This is a very historical place, and in the news now, Eagle, Texas wants to protect it itself against illegal people that are breaking in. And the federal government said no. And civil war threats began there in Eagle, Texas. This is this year, guys. Not last year, this year. Matthew 24. When Jesus talks about the signs of the times and the end of the age, he warns against false prophets and false Christ, the rapture, great tribulation, and his second coming. And he says, for wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Matthew 24, 28. Jesus is coming soon. Yes, he is. We cannot deny it. We all have a choice to make. Are we for slavery or not for slavery? Jesus Christ came to set the people free. Amen. Joel 3.16, it is the voice of God that causes the heavens and the earth to shake. That's the Amplified Version. The Lord will thunder and roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people and a stronghold to the children of Israel. God is saying to us, church, make our election sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Make sure you're in covenant with him that your heart is right. Make a decision to be on the right side of this. Make it your decision to know Jesus. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And stay with a body of believers who honor our king and serve him. One of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to convict, to convince people of their sin. John 16, seven through 11. God's message of judgment from the 4-8 eclipse always has the intent of repentance and reconciliation. Nineveh's repentance released God's mercy. Jonah 3.10, God saw that they turned from their evil way and God relented from the disaster that he said he would bring to them and he did not do it. So God does relent, but he counts on his people to repent Amen. before. And so because we're here and because we're, we're still live, we do want to do a call of repentance. So if you felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit, if you felt him moving and saying, you know what, I know I'm not right. We had a beautiful woman of God, 47 years old, a singer of the Lord, age 47, died this week. Mandisa died this week. The Lord is saying, you never know what can happen tomorrow. He's not trying to threaten us, but he's saying there are consequences. When we continue to walk in sin, when we continue to turn away from him, there are consequences. Let's make it right before him now. Amen. Father, we ask you, with every, high, every uh, head bowed, every, every ear open, Father, every heart open to what you want to say, Father. We ask you now, people who are listening or viewing, raise your hand now and say, Lord, I know I don't got it right, but I know you forgive and you relent. Mm -hmm. Father, make me yours. Turn my life around, Father. Turn my life around because I've made nothing but a mess of it. Mm -hmm. And I want you I want you, Father. I want to follow you. I want to know you. And I know, Jesus, you came for me. 
so that I could be with you forever in the Father. No, I'm not good, and I, I'm not good, and I'm not perfect, but you are. You are, and I receive you now, Jesus. I receive you now. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Father God. Remember, people, you don't have tomorrow. You don't have it. Make your decision now and make it sure. Say, Jesus, I want you. Call out to him and he will answer you. If you're not in a Bible-believing, faith-filled church, come here. We welcome you with open arms to In His Presence Church. If we're not close to you, listen to us online, and you can also find a local Bible-believing church that we can help you find if you're not local. We love you, Lord. We thank you. And we're happy to send the word of God to you so that you continue to walk in this journey. We love you, Lord, and we thank you.